uh, salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. So I'm continuing my series about uh, uh, English law. Um, I could indeed call it common law, as I've explained a number of times. It's found uh, in um, uh, common law countries, well, the Commonwealth, the United States, a few other countries, and it gets more complex because, um, uh, let's say, uh, a Sharia law and common law have been blended together in certain states in Nigeria, in Pakistan, um, and so on. There's tribal customary law in, in Zimbabwe as well. For instance, in Zimbabwe, someone can get married under tribal law or indeed under common law, things like that. So it's a bit about common law, reasoning, and uh, institutions. So uh, obviously one looks at precedent. That's what common law is, looking at things that are justified by past practice. Supposing there's a right of way across a private field. That right of way, because it's been there for a long time, since time immemorial, it's been recognised that people are allowed to walk across that path. And so that becomes a right of way. Things like that. Nobody can point to a time in recorded history when that wasn't the case. Um, supposing you're at school and uh, people have to wear uniform, but not six formers. They can choose what to wear. And then suddenly a new headmistress comes and she says, nope, the six formers have to wear the same as everybody else. You might be up in arms about it, say that's unacceptable. No way. We have this right. You, you can't suddenly take away our rights. That's not on. And really that's the same principle at work. Now, people can be deprived of their rights, the rules can change, but people normally kick back against it. So there's a rebuttable presumption, I suppose, that, uh, that common law, that things justified by past practice exist like that. There's statute, these are laws passed by legislatures, these are elected lawmaking bodies. Statute can trump uh, common law like that. And then common law is the whole idea of English law. It's confusing that the multiple meanings of common law like the different meanings of civil law. Civil law can be non-criminal law within common law. Civil law, therefore, taking in family law and, to some extent, contract, tort. Uh, um, let me see, what else? Admiralty. I could go on and on. Confusingly, as I've explained elsewhere, civil law also means the Roman law systems based on what they had in ancient Rome. And uh, it, you find that in France, Spain, Italy, Germany, most main European countries, and nations that were former colonies of France and Spain. For instance, more or less the whole of Latin America is a Roman law system. The former um, French countries in uh, Africa, likewise, uh, be like that. So there are major legal systems within the world of common law, and that's most of the Anglosphere and Roman law. Then uh, Chinese is a bit different in Russian former Soviet countries, Again, it's a bit different, but though it does draw on Roman law to some extent. Um, so there's always been a dialogue between Roman law and common law. Um, since the 70s, they somewhat converged, crossed over, but they may well be diverging again in the United Kingdom in the wake of Brexit, remains to be seen. So we know England and Wales is a common law country. That's, that's where it largely started, though again, it's not completely traditional, and it borrowed from... Um, uh, the Anglo-Saxons came up from Germany, taking their legal traditions with them, and, and it did borrow a little bit from ancient Roman and its turn from ancient Greece. So it's not, it's not entirely a re original. Um, and then Scotland is Roman law, though there's more in common with, with, uh, between Scots law and English law than some people would like to admit, especially if they're nationalists in Scotland. Um, one of the, well, perhaps the first digest of English law was Glanville's Tractatus, which um, he published in 1170. I say published, obviously it was handwritten. Uh, ran off to Glanville was a justicia, as in a senior judge, mainly in Northern England, there at the time of um, Henry II, who attempted a major um, shake-up of English law, um, the constitutions of Clarendon and so on, trying to bring the clergy um, within the remit of the king's courts. Um, I've spoken about that elsewhere, so I shan't be uh, uh, mired in that. Anyhow, Ranulph de Glanville wrote his treatise on uh, the laws of the uh, Kingdom of England. About 150 years later, there was um, uh, Reni Majestatum, if I got that right, the name of a Scots legal text, and uh, it uh, copied Glanville's Tractatus verbatim. So, um, and that, that makes up about two thirds of Regni Majestatum. 
So therefore, um, Scots law does borrow very heavily from English law in certain areas. Um, now, uh, Glanville's Tractatus, much of it is uh, describing what a writ is, how, case work, how cases works, is, is procedural rather than the legal principles per se, and the statutes and common law judgments. It's only around that time that, that equity was emerging as a major portion of uh, English law. So the differences between um, Scots law and English law shouldn't be overemphasized. Likewise, there's Stott, Donoghue and Stevenson, a case from um, 1934, if memory serves, the famous case of a snail in the bottle. It's a tort case, as in a woman pur purchasing a bottle of beer, there's a snail in it which caused it to fall ill. The person who sold it, the manufacturer, are they liable? Did, did they cause this in any way? Could they be held responsible? Do they have to compensate this woman from the, for the harm occasioned by selling this uh, faulty product? And it went through the courts in Scotland to the House of Lords, uh, which was for the whole of the United Kingdom. So usually 12 law lords. Um, so when I say the House of Lords, it's only the judges there. And they did get the title of Lord at that stage. Only the judges hear this case. Some people hear a case went to the House of Lords and they mentioned all the peers of the realm, the hereditary peers, and nowadays the life peers were involved in it. No, that's not the case. It's different now with the, with the Supreme Court. Although they are lords, the Supreme Court is a court, even meets in a separate building to emphasize that. But in those days, the law lords would meet in the House of Lords to hear these cases. And that was as high as you could go, a court of cassation for the um, United Kingdom. Nowhere else it could be referred to, had to be decided there. Very, very rare for a case to get there. And it was a seminal moment. They gave a landmark ruling about tort, saying that, yes, um, those who sold this, those who manufactured this, they are responsible, they are liable, and they can be sued in tort because they had to done, done a wrong to this woman they caused her to fall ill. Um, so tort is wrong, remember. So uh, of the 12 law lords, usually only two are from Scotland. When I say that, they're, they're advocates in the Scottish legal system. That's equivalent of a barrister in Scotland. The solicitors in Scotland are also called solicitors. Um, so you don't necessarily need to be Scots, but need to be qualified in that system. Um, when I say like a, a law lord from Northern Ireland, he or she doesn't necessarily actually have to be Northern Irish, simply qualified in that system. Likewise, English and Welsh lawyers don't ha have to be Welsh or English, simply qualified in that system. Though in practice, they almost always are English and Welsh. Anyway, the law lords decided that, and they said English law is exactly the same as Scots law on that point. So Scots law and English law can learn from each other. Another important thing is to say that uh, cases from um, other common law countries are influential, but they're not binding. Courts can look at how, how an issue was handled um, elsewhere. Uh, to see what they're going to decide, like Carlisle and uh, Carbolic Smokeball, a famous contract case that would often be cited in the United States and elsewhere, or Pinnell's case would be cited there. Likewise, there's some um, cases about uh, women's coats for sale and is a man allowed to purchase them if they're on offer in the United States? And the um, English courts would look at the way the various courts in the United States handle them. Bearing in mind that each state in the United States has its own legal system, has different statutes, but again, they do learn from each other. These systems are not hermetically sealed. So that's the way it goes. <clears throat> Likewise, in tort, the English and Welsh courts, they look at cases and how they've been handled in, in Australia, in Hong Kong, <coughs> places like that. So Hong Kong, even though it's part of China, it's a special administrative region, and it still has, um, it still has common law. Uh, so um, that's that. Common law reasoning, reasoning institutions, looking back to Blackson's Commentaries on the Laws of England, published in the mid-18th century, and uh, it's divided thematically, um, the rights of things, the rights of people, and blah, blah, blah. It's not chronological, as some people might uh, uh, wrongly imagine. So um, the reasoning and institutions are, well, as I say, looking at past practice, looking at legislation. Legislation can trump the, the rulings of courts, um, and there's much debate over statutory interpretation, statute, the laws passed by a legislature, and legislators are the men and women who are um, uh, elected to them. And uh, there's a spirited debate about whether the um, judges, should they guess the parliamentarians' intentions? What if they didn't make themselves clear? Sometimes there's a ambiguity, and they have to go with the social reality. Certain laws can be held to be antique um, because they haven't been... Uh, 
used for a long time, are they in, in abeyance? Uh, for instance, this is probably the case in relation to um, criminal libel. As I say, there's not been a, even an attempted prosecution since the 70s, not a successful prosecution since, goodness, I can't think, think when. Um, but sometimes the law will be updated to reflect that. For instance, the Slander of Women Act was repealed in 2013, which was accusing a, a woman of unchastity, that's to say, engaging in sexual relations outside of matrimony. That was, uh, that was um, libel, uh, whereas it was not of a man. And so the, the Parliament amended that to reflect the social reality. I can't think of the last time that somebody uh, made a, a claim about that, about slander of women. Um, but, but even if they had in 2003, before the repeal of the Germain Act, it may well be that a court decided this, this no longer counts as slander. Right, so that's just um, a little bit about uh, the um, a little bit about uh, common law reasoning and institutions.